Hello everyone. Welcome back to the class of Analysis of Facial Beauty. I'm Dr. Strategic. Today we are talking about the aging process in more detail. The process of aging is the sum of factors acting on all of four main components involved in the facial aesthetics. Number one, the soft tissue quality. Number two, the soft tissue quantity. Number three, the soft tissue dynamics. Number four, the supporting bony, dental, and cartilaginous skeleton. The causes almost always start to act early on the facial tissue, but the consequences are manifest only over the long term. This reminds us of many of the great problems that humans are incapable of solving, such as wars, the hole in the ozone layer, the big financial crisis, environmental pollution, and many others. In all cases, nobody recognizes himself as being guilty because our single action is so small and so distant in time and space that we have completely lost the connections when the problem arises in its full extent. So, one of the difficult tasks in facial analysis is the early detection of the sign of aging in the younger patient as well as the identification of the basic developmental deformities that worsen the final effect of aging. In other words, we must observe the young subject now also thinking in terms of future aging. When a young or middle-aged subject appears aged, the presence of one or more structural factors of aging should be suspected, looked for, and assessed. For example, the association of two structural factors one affecting the soft tissue, such as the vertical long upper lip, and another affecting the dental and skeletal framework, such as the vertical short maxilla, can produce an aged appearance affecting all the lower facial third. This negative combination also influences the act of smiling of the patient as a result of the reduced exposure of the upper anterior teeth. Sometimes, the structural factors of aging are not easily detected because of the compensation offered by soft tissue envelope, which, in a young subject, has an important role in camouflage. A typical example is the effect of teeth extraction performed in childhood for orthodontic needs, as in the clinical case of the young girl shown in the screen. Before the orthodontic treatment, the main concern of her parents was the protruding anterior teeth. Her dentist solved the problem by extracting an upper premolar on each side and retracting the upper incisors, but the left untreated or misdiagnosed the mandibular deficiency. When her case was documented at the age of 26 years, the initial signs of aging on the upper lip were evident and will worsen in the future when the camouflage effects produced by the soft tissue envelope progressively disappear. This case confirms the initial assertion that if our actions, in other words, the teeth extraction and orthodontic treatment, are so distant in time and space, we and our patients too lose the connections between the cause and effect when the problem of aging arises in its full magnitude. To prevent the aesthetic problem of this dentofacial deformity as well as the confronting the aging process, a different treatment should have been done when she was in her teens like avoid the extraction of upper premolars and extract one inferior premolar on each side. Retract the inferior anterior teeth with orthodontics. And finally, perform the surgical advancement of the mandible to correct the sagittal component of the malocclusion as well as the facial profile. Generally, aging acts by changing the skin through two distinct basic processes. Intrinsic and extrinsic. Intrinsic aging is inevitable, not beyond voluntary control, and reflects the genetic backgrounds of the subject. Extrinsic aging is mainly caused by sun exposure, but also by smoking, excessive use of alcohol, and poor nutrition, so in some ways it can be prevented. In clinical facial analysis, but also when Communicating with the patient, it is imperative to differentiate between the quality of the skin, 
which consists of the skin color, texture, tone, elasticity, pigmented lesion, and the quantity and displacement of skin and other facial soft tissue. Aging also acts by reducing volumes, enlarging the surface, and displacing facial soft tissue, a process of atrophy, dermal atrophy, muscle atrophy, connective tissue atrophy, red atrophy is responsible for volume reduction. A process of skin and connective tissue elongation, real or relative, is responsible for redundancy, back formation, and ptosis. The interaction between the two previous processes also permits the displacing in the vertical direction or infraorbital, malar, facial, and neck fat. The same displacement can also affect the lacrimal and some mandibular glands. Some facial convexities become flat with aging, such as the cheek and lips, and some flat areas bulge, such as the lower lid and the submental. Muscular activity can produce evident skin creases and, at the same time, can hold up some skin areas, as happens with the eyebrows, giving the false impression that its position is correct. When analyzing the face, a special effort is made by the observer to envision the direction of the underlying mimetic muscles and correlate it to external visible effects. A pre-existing dentofacial deformity can aggravate and anticipate the aged look. If a patient looks older, check on the personal patient photographs, searching for any pre-existing aging signs and for the general features of the facial skeleton. The lack of support can be localized or extended over more subunits of the face, affecting the bone, cartilaginous, and dental framework. When recognizing their aging in the face, there are general considerations as follows. A comparison between the useful and aged faces reveals one or more of these changes. Number one, the general face form becomes longer and narrower. It can also shift from a triangular to rectangular shape. Number two, some subunits become empty and others become full. Number three, some profiles curve splatten. Number four, some new curves appear. Number five, some profile segments elongate. Some signs of aging are absent in a useful face, such as the platysma band, whereas the others already present in young subject and their change, as when the nasolabial line transforms into a nasolabial groove and fold, underlines the progress of aging. Instead of the discussing the theory of the facial aging in depth, a list of clinical signs of aging from forehead to neck is presented with some relative specific considerations. The first is the forehead transverse furrows. The horizontal forehead furrows are usually two or three continuous or centrally interrupted lines. They are secondary to chronic frontalis muscle contraction produced as an effort to raise the descended eyebrows. As with any other mimetic wrinkle, line or furrow, the forehead transverse furrows are perpendicularly oriented to the underlying muscular fibers. The next is the frown lines. The frown lines can be divided into vertical and horizontal. The vertical frown lines occupy the glabella, usually one for each side and are perpendicular to the orientation of the fibers of the corrugator muscle, whereas the horizontal frowns line are typically a single line occupying the radix of the nose and is perpendicular to the orientation of the fiber of the procerus muscle, which is considered to a mimetic line. The next is a temporal depression. The facial aging process can be seen in some areas as a progressive volume reduction of soft tissue producing the effect of cold skeletonization, whereas in others, the soft tissue progressively increases or is made redundant producing the opposite effect of hiding the skeletal and muscular contour. The temporal region usually undergoes a gradual loss of volume producing a depression that is responsible for highlighting its skeletal boundaries. The zygomatic arch, 
the letter orbital rim and the temporal crest. The next is the eyebrow ptosis. Detecting eyebrow ptosis is not so easy because of the contraction of the frontalis muscle, which produces some degree of balancing elevation, as well as the confusing the brow ptosis as a unique problem of the hooded upper eyelid skin. The eyebrow, as with many other facial structures, is moving target. So, after the correction of the ptotic upper marginal lid, the frontalis muscle contraction reduces with a downward repositioning of the eyebrow, which is now clearly ptotic to the examiner and patient. Another problem lies in the illusional effect produced by a deeper upper prefabral fold and prominent upper orbital margins. The resulting horizontal shadow makes the eyebrow more ptotic, even if it is in the same vertical position. The loss of upper perfebral volume, either to a progressive involution or secondary to aggressive surgical treatment, creates a skeletonized orbit that is also responsible for this shadow. In eyebrow analysis, it is important to detect the lateral extension over the eyelid and onto the lateral periorbital region of the upper lid crease or corner sign which is a hallmark of the forehead ptosis. The correct vertical position of the eyebrow can be envisioned during the consultation utilizing the flowers maneuver by holding up the eyebrow with a fingertip. Upper eyelid hooding. The attenuation of the orbicularis orculi muscle and the orbital septum, the orbital fat pad, pseudo herniation, as well as the progressive gravitational descent of the forehead skin and upper lid laxity can produce upper eyelid hooding, which is usually more pronounced in the lateral aspect. The eventual fullness in the medial aspect is due to more to orbital fat pad, pseudo herniation than skin excess. The redundancy of the skin or dermatogelasis can be assessed by pinching the excess of eyelid skin with a forcep until the eyelashes begin to evert. Crow's feet and eyelid wrinkle. Crow's feet and eyelid wrinkles are fine wrinkles or lines developing on the lower lid and the lateral aspect of the orbital region perpendicular to the fibers of the underlying orbicularis orculi muscle. In the evolution toward more evident lines, the attenuation and elongation of the muscle fibers as well as the skin laxity and gravitational descent also play a role. The next is the lateral cantar bowing. Lateral cantar bowing is a secondary to the progressive laxity of the lateral cantar tendon. The visible effect is an inferiorly rotated lateral lid commissure with the loss of the upward lateral tilt of the intercantal axis. Regarding scleral show, the inferior scleral show is the presence of a strip of white sclera between the iris and the lower rate margin with the subject in natural head position and straight gaze. As a sign of aging, it is caused by the progressive laxity of the canthal tendons and the tarsus of the lower lid. The next is a baggy lower eyelid. The baggy lower eyelid is secondary to the combination of attenuation and lengthening of the skin, the orbicularis orculi muscle, the canthal tendons, and the orbital septum with pseudo herniation of the orbital fat. Orbital fat pseudo herniation can be pointed out and documented with the eye view looking up pictures. The next is a tear trough deformity, as known as the perfebral jugal fold and perfebral mala groove. Arterial trough deformity is a depression that develops along the medial part of the inferior orbital rim, which makes the region skeletonized. It is related to loss of the fat secondary to aging or aggressive surgical lipectomy, but it can also be present in young untreated subjects. The eventual demarcation between the lower lid and the mala area as a lateral continuation of the perfebral jugal fold is the perfebral mala groove. Mala bags, or festoons, or cheek bags. 
Mala bags or festoons can be differentiated from the baggy lower eyelid because they occur below the level of the inferior orbital rim. They are caused by attenuation of the orbicularis arculi muscle and the overlying skin as well as by ptosis of the suborbicularis arculi fat pad. The next is a nasolabial fold. This is the landmark that separates the lip from the cheek. Loss of cheek support results in anterior inferior descent of the subcutaneous fat with inferior accumulation of tissue, deepening the folds, and superior loss of tissue. The fat cannot continue its descent because of the presence at the level of the nasolabial line of dense fascia to dermis adherence. This leads to the formation of the deep nasolabial group and a heavy nasolabial fold more or less associated with skeletonized appearance of the cheekbone. Pre-auricular lines. These vertically oriented lines, usually two or three, develop in the pre-auricular region in front of the tragus and the lobule. And the next is the lip lines. The upper and lower radial lip lines are Mimetic wrinkles that are more pronounced as they reach the vermilion. They are caused by the association between the repeated muscular contracture, dermal atrophy, and attenuation and lengthening of the orbicularis oris muscle. This horizontally oriented line usually develops over the upper lip filtrum as a single skin wrinkle. The horizontally Oriented line usually develops over the upper lip filtrum as a single skin wrinkle. The vertical length of the skin portion of the upper lip increases during the entire lifetime with a progressive augmentation of the skin vermilion ratio. Also, the thickness and the anterior projection in profile view are prone to diminish with a reduction in volume of the red portion of the lip. This is called red lip involution. An accompanying sign is the ptosis of the two commissure. The corner of mouth lines are short, vertically oriented, bilateral, sometimes very deep lines that depart from the oral commissure, whereas the marionette lines are longer, vertical lines that laterally circumscribe the chin. The jowl is an accumulation of subcutaneous fat along an inferior to the mandibular border. Its anterior limits, the pre-jowl depression, are defined by the presence of the mandibular retaining ligaments, which prevent any further anterior migration of fat. The witch chin deformity or ptotic chin is the flattening and ptosis of chin pad associated with the deepening of the cemental crease. It can be age-related or secondary to previous surgery. Platysma bands are vertical, large skin bands, one for each side, rising from the submental area and extending inferiorly, altering the cervical mental profile. Muscular attenuation, lengthening, and dehiscence along with fat accumulation and neck skin relaxation cause these bands. The horizontal semicircular neck lines occupy the anterior neck skin and are perpendicular to the underlying fibers of platysma muscle. Their presence in the form of fine lines precedes the other signs of neck aging. The ptosis of the inferior pole of the submandibular gland produce a bulge on the submandibular region, one or two centimeters inferior to the mandibular border. The glandular origin of the bulge is confirmed with palpation. The next topic is the recognition of the nasal aging. With aging, the nose undergoes many important changes that should not be ignored during clinical examination. Furthermore, in adult or older subjects, the probability of finding signs of previous nasal trauma or surgery is high. The nasal skin soft tissue envelope loses elasticity and becomes attenuated, permitting a gravitational descent of the lip. The cartilaginous framework reduces some of its tensile strength and the ligamentous structures that maintain the lower lateral cartilages together and suspended to the upper lateral ones become less efficacious. 
Some of the visible and palpable effects of the nasal aging are number one, the presence of the horizontal frown lines occupying the radix perpendicular to the orientation of the fibers of the procerus muscle. Number two, skin atrophy except for the tip area, which can undergo an increased sebaceous activity, augmenting its thickness. Number three, the clockwise rotation of the tip, which becomes ptotic and underprojected. Number four, ptosis of the columella with a reduction in the nasolabial angle and a relative deepening of the subnasal point. Number five, increased prominence of the dorsal hump as a secondary effect of the progressive skeletonization of the nose and loss of tip projection. The external signs are associated with many internal changes that are responsible for a progressive reduction of the function of the nose, such as warming, humidifying, and a cleaning the ambient air on inspiration. These changes must not be under-evaluated in the preoperative phase. Many visible effects of aging in the lower third of the face are concentrated in the oral frame. The reduction of the exposed vermilion is accompanied by the disappearance of the lip white rolls. The progressive elongation of the upper lip obscures the upper anterior teeth both in repose and while smiling. The progressive lower lip descends, increasing the exposure of the lower anterior teeth both in repose and while smiling. The teeth morphology changes due to abrasion of the incisors and canine margin and gingival retraction. The resulting length of the anterior visible teeth depends on the combination of the marginal abrasion and gingival retraction. The followings are the aging face analysis checklists. In the frontal view, the facial shape is triangular, rectangular, wide, narrow, long, or short. Question number two, does the face look old? No, yes, because. Number three, does the face look skeletonized? No, yes, because. Define the facial supporting skeletal framework. Ideal for sex and age. Altered because. Define the facial fat distribution. Ideal for sex and age. Or altered because. Define the facial skin redundancy. Absent, moderate, or marked. The hairline is normally positioned too high or too low. The forehead profile is flat, round, or presence of inferior concavity, clear, definite orbital bar. The supraorbital bar is normally shaped, protruding, or recessive. Forehead transverse lines, just visible, moderate, or marked. Vertical frown lines or glabella lines is absent, moderate, or marked. Horizontal frown lines, nasal radix lines is absent, moderate, marked. The temporal depression is absent, moderate, or marked. Does the orbital region look aged? No, or yes, because. Define the eyebrow vertical positions. In other words, the eyebrow ptosis is ideal for sex and age or altered because define the symmetry of the eyebrows present or absent due to define the symmetry of the eye globes present or absent due to define the symmetry of the eyelids present or absent due to define the upper lid crease position is ideal too high or too low. Define the upper lid margin position. Is ideal too high or too low? Define the lower lid margin position. Is ideal too high or too low? Define the lateral canthus position. Ideal or altered because. Upper eyelid dermatochalysis is absent, moderate, marked, or limiting the supratemporal visual field. Upper eyelid ptosis, right or left. Upper lid herniated orbital fat, no, right or left. 
prolapse lacrimal gland, no right or left. Skeletal lower lid support, poor, acceptable, or ideal. Defined malar eminence is hypoplastic, balanced, or pronounced. Lower eyelid laxity, no right or left. Baggy lower eyelid, absent, moderate, or marked. Lower lid herniated orbital fat, no right or left. Lateral cantal bowing is absent, moderate, marked. Scleral shows no or yes. Hypertrophic orbicularis orculi muscle, right or left. Crow's feet and eyelid wrinkles, absent, moderate, or marked. Tear trough deformity is absent, moderate, or marked. Palpebra mala fold is absent, moderate, or marked. Mala bags, no, right, or left. Eye globe proptosis, as known as the exophthalmos, right, left. Eye globe in ophthalmos, right or left. Does the nose look aged? No. Or yes, because. Does the nose look skeletonized? No. Or yes. Is there loss of tip projection? No. Or yes. Is there column melaptosis? No. Or yes. Preauricular lines are absent, moderate, or marked. Nasolabial fold is ideal for sex and age. Increased or heavy. Does the mouth look aged? No or yes because. Vertical length of the upper lip is short, ideal for sex and age, slightly augmented or augmented. Upper lip skin vermilion ratio is ideal for sex and age or increased. The upper lip profile is normally projected to anterior or to posterior. The lower lip profile is normally projected to anterior or to posterior. Upper lip lines are absent, moderate, or marked. Horizontal upper lip line is absent, moderate, or marked. Lower lip lines are absent, moderate, or marked. Ptosis of the lip commissure is absent, moderate, or marked. Corner of the mouth lines are absent, moderate, or marked. Marionette lines are absent, moderate, or marked. Jowls is absent, moderate, or marked. Which is chin deformity is absent, moderate, or marked. Does the neck look aged? No, or yes, because. Horizontal length lines are minimal, moderate, or marked. Platysma bands are absent, moderate, or marked. Ptotics of mandibular gland is absent, moderate, or marked, whether left or right. Define the mandibular border definition from angle to chin is ideal or poor. Define the throat length is ideal, too short or too long. Define the throat incline is ideal or excessively down-oriented. The finally, define the cervical mental angle is ideal, too acute, or too obtuse. The final part of today's class is the preferred terms regarding the aging phase. The superficial age-related changes in the skin can be classified as follows. The first is the wrinkles, as known as the fine superficial lines. They are associated with textural changes of the skin surface. Mimetic wrinkles, as known as the lines or furrows. They are the visible effect of deep dermal creasing caused by the repeated facial movement and expression combined with dermal elastosis. These lines are perpendicularly oriented with respect to the underlying vascular fibers. The mimetic wrinkles can be divided into lines, partial thickness, and furrows full thickness. Finally, there are skin folds. It is overlapping of skin. 
There are the result of the overlapping skin caused by laxity, loss of tone, gravity, and consequent sagging. There are many other terms, baggy eyelid, which is known as the inferior lid bags, the bulge affecting the lower lid area secondary to the combination of attenuation and lengthening of the skin, orbicularis arculi muscle, canthal tendons, and the orbital septum with pseudo herniation of the orbital fat. The next term is the blepharochalysis. It should be differentiated from the dermatochalysis. It is an uncommon condition characterized by episodic edema and erythema of the eyelids. Blepharochalysis is more common in young women and may result in premature relaxation and laxity of the eyelid skin with wrinkles and hooding. Corner sign. It means a lateral extension over the eyelid and onto the lateral periorbital region. The corner sign is considered the hallmark of the forehead ptosis. Crow's feet and eyelid wrinkles. They are fine wrinkles or lines developing on the lower lid and the lateral aspect of the orbital region perpendicular to the fibers of the underlying orbicularis arculi muscle. The next is the eyelid bags, as known as the baggy eyelid. The visible bags of the lower eyelid caused by the processes of the pseudo herniation of the orbital fat and the attenuation and lengthening of the orbital septum, orbicularis orculi muscle, skin, and lower canthus. Dermatochalysis. It is excess of an eyelid skin that is usually more prevalent in the upper eyelid. It is a frequent condition in middle-aged subject and a common one in the elderly. Festoons or cheekbones or malabags. They are a kind of ptosis of the suborbicularis orcli fat. Mala bags should be differentiated from eyelid bags because they occur below the inferior orbital rims. Forehead transverse furrows. It is also called as a worry lines. The long horizontal mimetic furrows developing on the forehead perpendicular to the fibers of the underlying frontalis muscle are forehead transverse furrows. Glabella crisis. It is also known as the frown lines or vertical glabella lines. They are the mainly vertical-oriented mimetic skin lines developing on the glabella perpendicular to the fibers of the underlying corrugator muscle. Herniated orbital fat, which is known as the pseudo-herniated orbital fat. It is the anterior displacement of the fat located under the orbital septum. It should be examined with the patient in the upright sitting or standing position. The orbital fat pads are classically divided into two upper compartments, medial and central, and three lower compartments, medial, central, and lateral. Horizontal upper lip lines, as known as the transverse upper lip lines. They are one or two horizontal lines located centrally over the filtrum of the upper lip. Intercantal axis is the imaginary line connecting the medial and lateral canthus. Jowls. It is a visible accumulation of subcutaneous fat along and in inferior to the mandibular border. Its anterior limits, the pre-jowl depression, are defined by the presence of the mandibular retaining ligaments, which prevent any further anterior migration of fat. Labial commissure is the point of lateral confluence of the lips. During the act of smiling, it consists of the inner and the outer commissure. Lugophthalmos is incomplete eyelid closure. Lateral canthal bowing. It is the condition secondary to the progressive laxity of the lateral canthal tendon. The visible effect is an inferiorly rotated lateral lid commissure with a loss of upward lateral tilt of the intercanthal axis. Lead tone as known as the eyelid laxity. It is the ability of the lead to maintain spontaneously and recover or recapture quickly their normal position against the globe. The presence of horizontal lead laxity should be assessed by the performing the snap test and the lead distraction test.
the lid should not be pulled more than 7 mm away from the globe and should snap back into its normal position immediately. Lip white rolls are the linear white skin relief placed around the vermilion border of both lips. It flattens and sometimes totally disappears with aging. Lip lines are the upper and the lower radial lip lines. They are mimetic wrinkles, which are more pronounced as they reach the vermilion. Marionette and commissural lines, as known as the corner of the mouth lines. They are vertically oriented lines which develop directly from the oral commissure or above and laterally to it. Nasolabial fold and nasolabial groove are the landmark that separates the lip from the cheek. Loss of cheek support results in an anterior inferior descent of subcutaneous fat with accumulation of inferior tissue, deepening the folds and loss of superior tissues. The fat cannot continue its descent because of the presence of the dense fascia to dermis adherence at the level of the nasolabial line. The various final effects are the formation of deep nasolabial groove and heavy nasolabial fold. Palpebral mala groove, the eventual demarcation between the lower lid and the mala area. Platysma band, which is known as the turkey gobbler effect. The vertical skin bands usually one for each side of the aged cementer and neck region. They are caused by the platysma muscle attenuation, lengthening and dehiscence along with fat accumulation and skin excess of the photo damage. Preauricular lines are vertically oriented lines, usually two or three, which develop in the preauricular region in front of the tragus and the lobule. A prolapsed lacrimal gland can produce an excessive fullness of the upper eyelid in the temporal third. There is no orbital fat in the upper temporal angle of the orbit. Red lip involution. It is the progressive reduction of exposed vermilion as well as its volume, combined with the augmentation of the vertical length of the upper lip skin. Scleral show. It is the presence of the strip of white sclera between the iris and the lower lid margin with the subject in natural head position and straight gaze. It may be a sign of the exophthalmos, previous trauma, prior surgery, lower lid laxity, or dentofacial deformities with maxillary hypoplasia. Some mandibular gland ptosis is the visible bulge produced by the inferior pore of the submandibular gland in the submandibular triangle. Tear trough deformity is a depression that develops along the medial part of the inferior orbital rim, which makes the region skeletonized. It is related to the loss of fat secondary to aging or aggressive surgical lipectomy, but it can also be present in young untreated subjects. Temporal atrophy, the progressive loss of soft tissue volume that affects the temporal region and makes its skeletal boundaries more visible. The transverse nasal line is the horizontal single frown line occupying the radix perpendicular to the orientation of the fibers of the procerus muscle, which is thin deformity, ptotic chin, the flattening and the ptosis of the chin pad associated with the deepening of the submental crease. It can be age-related or iatrogenic. Okay, today we have talked about the aging phase. Thanks for watching and stay tuned.